Thank you guys. I um, have had many, many years to, to learn to teach in a different context. Uh, I normally would teach maths and funny enough, I would be really, really comfortable teaching all of you guys calculus, how to differentiate polynomials. I'd be confident that I could get you guys doing this within a couple of sessions. Um, and yet, when I get something like this, I am new to this, so please be patient with me. Um, this is a very new experience for me. Since February, we've been focusing on 15 New Testament words um, from a book written by uh, Gupta. Uh, this book's been really informative for me and has helped me really understand these words in the context in which they were intended. And many of these words have got different meanings um, compared to today's world, and are simply, or they're simply not used in um, modern English anymore. Don spoke about righteousness. I discussed gospel a while ago. Uh, Harold, forgiveness. Don, the cross. Chris spoke about life. Don, faith. Jason, grace. Matt Gray did witness. And the word that we're focusing on today is salvation. Uh, the first scripture that I want to read to you today comes from Revelation 7, 9, verse 12. It goes as follows. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You might remember there's a song that we used to sing quite frequently in, in, in the old days, um, and which is based primarily on these verses. And that song invokes an incredible sense of uh, gratitude inside of me um, towards God, a sense of uh, overwhelming peace um, and, and, and adoration toward a God who has saved me into his kingdom through the works of Jesus dying on the cross. So, salvation. Another word for, from, uh, another word for salvation from the Greek word sotoria, this is the extent of my Greek uh, studies, is to rescue. And often another word used for rescue would be saved or to be saved. And preachers often asked, or other people have often asked, are you saved? If you died tonight, uh, would you go to heaven? There's one implied question that's really been asked here, which concerns the long-term state of the person's um, soul. Traditionally, the question was asked referring to whether or not you had accepted Jesus into your life, and in turn, we're going to heaven thus avoiding eternal torment, avoiding hell. Uh, preachers often talked about just saving souls from eternal damnation. The focus was, or their focus, primarily all about the afterlife. Uh, today we're looking, with our word salvation, at what are we saved from, yes, and what are we saved into, or what are we saved for? Gupta, the book that we're following, um, mentions the following story, which really moved me. And um, I ended up watching a documentary about this um, during my preparations for this sermon. Um, it was a distraction that I felt was really, really well worth it. Um, and it goes like this. In 1965, and some of you may know the story, it was new to me, uh, six Tongan boys, aged 13 to 16, they ran away from Tonga. They stole a seven-metre boat and they ended up shipwrecked on an island called Ata, 300 kilometres or miles 
away from Tonga. I can't remember exactly where those kilometers and miles um, away from Tonga. They, were, they ended up being there for 15 months. Uh, the island was really in, inhospitable at first, and the boys were initially stuck at the bottom of a very, very steep cliff. Whilst there, they had to drink even bird's blood as they couldn't find fresh water at that point. They also had no way of making fire, so they ate raw birds and raw fish. That lasted 100 days until finally they made their way up the cliffs where they found pineapples, coconuts and other fruits. They also managed to find fresh water, which was good, and they lit a fire, which they kept burning continuously from that moment onwards. Finally, they could cook their birds and eat uh, nice, cooked, wholesome food, which they really, really enjoyed. Life on the island was really, really hard. Uh, one of the boys even broke a leg while he was there. Um, he healed up well, by the way, and, um, but for a few scars, he did really well. Back home in Tonga, uh, funerals had been held. Uh, all hope had been lost for these boys, and um, very sad for the families. So one day, whilst looking for new fishing grounds, Captain Peter Warner uh, uh, noticed burnt areas on the island as he was uh, searching for, for new places to look for fish. He knew this would be strange in these tropical islands to have burnt areas on the islands uh, due to all the rain that was frequently there. When the boys noticed the ship, they quickly made their presence known to him and he re uh, the captain recounted being really, really nervous wondering if perhaps these were dangerous criminals that had been exiled to the island. After verifying the boys' identity via radio, the boys were welcomed onto his boat and um, given food, water, clothes, and then returned to Tonga. This is the point where a rescue story would normally end. Excuse me. I don't know about you, but... How often do you watch a rescue uh, movie or story and you wonder what happened to those people beyond that point? Really, really frustrating sometimes. And the good news is for you, the story continues. So, upon arrival in Tonga, the boys were charged, were to be charged straight away for the theft of the boat that they had stolen. <laughs> um, obviously, the families were excited to have them home, but there were the authorities who were upset about the situation, as well as the pe person who the boat was stolen from. Peter, the rescuer, he did something quite remarkable. He paid the $200 fee to have the charges dropped for stealing the boat. He himself then moved permanently from Sydney to Tonga, where he set up a fishing business. He hired those boys to be his new crew. After many years, one of the boys described Peter as being like a father to him. An amazing story. Not only of rescuing from something, but also into something. Peter provided for those boys an amazing future, which they otherwise would not have had. Let's take it to the Bible. A clear story of um, salvation for Israel in the Old Testament is that of Exodus. Israel uh, was brought out of slavery into the Promised Land. Uh, most of us know this story really well, but just to um, help us all get back into the scene, here we go, well, let's give you some background. The Israelites, they were God's chosen people um, at the time, and we join in this amazing story just as God sends Joseph ahead of them to become influential in Egypt. Pharaoh's, he became Pharaoh's right-hand man. God knew that um, Israel would need an influential person as a famine was coming to Egypt. Joseph, who has an amazing story of his own, of course, helps the, the then Pharaoh to stock up the nation with food and supplies. Then the famine finally arrived. The Israelites, they moved to Egypt as Joseph's family and guests. 
There they are saved from dying of starvation. That's not the saved that we're talking about now, though. As time goes on, they end up becoming slaves um, in that, and, and are oppressed by the Egyptians. God sends a very reluctant Moses to Pharaoh, who ends up convincing Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Yes, with a bit of, a bit of assistance from plagues and other events, one of which included all firstborn children being killed, which is where we see the origin of the Passover. It's also worth noting, however, that um, God did provide a way for some firstborn children to be saved. The angel of death bypassed all homes which had the blood of the lamb dabbed on the doorway to that home. After leaving Egypt, the Israelites were again chased by the Egyptians to the edge of the Red Sea. There God instructed Moses to do the following. Uh, Moses, uh, I'll read this for you. Exodus 14, 21 to 23. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove back with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians set out in pursuit all, all of Pharaoh's horses his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea after them. I don't know about you, but at this point the Israelites had been sent away from Israel, uh, from uh, Egypt, and they obviously were under the impression that things were good, and yet they're still being chased. Um, they go into the Red Sea, God opens up this, and what happens? All of Egypt's chariots and horsemen follow them into the Red Sea you'd be a bit discouraged, thinking, surely, is this, is this the end or not? Um, are we free or not? But clearly God ha- wanted to demonstrate his faithfulness by doing the following. We continue in Exodus 14, 26 to 29. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back onto the Egyptians on their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea And at daybreak, the sea returned to its normal depth. While the Egyptians were trying to escape from it, the Lord threw them into the sea. The water came back and covered the chariots and horsemen, plus the entire army of Pharaoh that had gone after them into the sea. Not even one of them survived, but the Israelites had walked through on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the power of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. An amazing story, which is well recounted even by God himself uh, when writing the Ten Commandments. If we read in Deuteronomy Deuteronomy, uh, 5-6, he says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. However, God wasn't just about rescuing from Egypt. He had a purpose. He had a plan. Amos 2.10 says, And I brought you from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in in the wilderness, another story in itself, in order to possess the land of the Amorite. Also, Deuteronomy 6.23, When your son asks you in the future, What is the meaning of the decrees and statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. Before our eyes, the Lord inflicted great and devastating signs and wonders on Egypt, on Pharaoh and on his household. But he brought us from there in order that he might lead us in and give us the land that he swore to our ancestors. Probably a good time to pray. Father God, we um, thank you that we are here today. We thank you that we are here to hear your word. 
We thank you that you want us to be saved. We thank you that you have a plan for each and every one of us. And we ask that as we continue reading this word today, that you help us to fully understand um, and hear your heart through this sermon. We ask that your words can be spoken and that your love can be sensed throughout. Thank you, Father. Something else to note um, in the Old Testament, salvation uh, had nothing to do with avoiding hell. For them, in those days, to be saved by God was to live in peace with God and in harmony with others. In that sense, salvation was not a one-and-done event. It was the beginning of the way life should be. Another salvation story would be that of uh, Noah. Why, why did God save, Noah, save him? Uh, did God intend for him and his family to be saved from the flood only to then abandon them? Clearly God wanted Noah and his family to live a long and fruitful life beyond the flood. We're going to focus primarily today on 1 and 2 Timothy and a little bit of Titus, um, Paul's writings. And Paul uses the language of saviour extensively in these books. Uh, 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 and 6 uh, goes as follows. First of all then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Saviour, who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We could continue on with this, or we could do calculus. You can, you can choose. Which one would you prefer? Um, shall we keep going with this one? Okay, Gupta, um, the author of a book that we are following, he's concerned that we see how comprehensive salvation really is, um, that we are saved from and for something. From and for something. I'm going to give you a story. Uh, many, many years ago, I did a scuba diving course and um, this goes back when I was still living overseas in South Africa. And for our final qualification dive, we had to do, or for our final qualification, we had to do five open water dives at around about 20 meters of depth out at sea. This was done from a boat, and we were 15 kilometers out at sea with all of our own gear that we had to supply. Getting ready for the first dive, I was sitting on the edge of the boat, and I began suiting up. And one of the first essential items that you wear is a lead weight belt around your waist. Unfortunately, my belt slipped from my grasp on the first dive and um, fell over the side of the boat. My response at the time, sadly, was, oopsie daisies. My friend never let me forget that statement, um, oopsie daisies. Uh, immediately, as this happened, the dive instructor, he dove off the boat and he free dove, uh, free dive, free dove, free dived, whatever the word is, um, math teacher. Um, he free dove, we'll go with dove, um, the 18 metres or so of depth to save the belt. Moments later, he turned up um, with the belt. The amazing story was, it wasn't my one, it was another one he had found there and then at the bottom of the ocean, <laughs> right there. Uh, what an amazing story. From that moment onwards, that belt was saved and was now mine. Um, I'll continue with that story in a moment. But remember, we're looking at being saved from and for something. From and for something. That belt was saved from the bottom of the ocean. The saved from portion, saved from sin and death. We're going to come back to that other story in a moment. But two aspects. We're saved from sin and death. Paul says... In 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 16. 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 16. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them. But I receive mercy for this reason, so that in me, 
The worst of them, Christ Jesus, might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Clearly, Paul believed um, that sinners were in need of saving from their own sins, Paul claiming he was the worst of them all. However, however, Paul also focuses on the wider problem of evil, which was eternal death. We're saved not only from our sins, but also from eternal death uh, into his, into God's eternal kingdom. Paul confidently says in 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his kingdom, heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God has saved me personally from the penalty of sin and you. My justification, just as if I'd never sinned, um, has been imputed onto me. I've never been I've been saved from eternal separation from God. Let's go back to the scuba diving story. Without a weight belt, uh, we've got problems. We're too buoyant. We float, especially me. Um, we float, and we can't submerge the bottom of the ocean, especially when we're wearing wetsuits and other dive gear. So without that belt, my dive would have been, my dive qualification would have been impossible to, to achieve thus disqualifying me from being qualified. The value of the belt was well appreciated by my dive instructor. Uh, He knew that we had no spares on the boat, and this is why he instantly dove into the water to search for my lost belt. I'm not sure why he never found my belt, but I am sure that God provided me with a replacement one that day. Um, God knew that I would really learn to worship him while swimming at the bottom of the ocean. Some of my greatest moments have been um, while swimming in the oceans, my greatest moments of, of worshipping God, appreciating God, as I, as I look at what he's created down at the bottom of the ocean, it's absolutely amazing. He knew that not everyone would experience this world, just those who had the right gear, including a weight belt. You see, that weight belt was saved from the bottom, from the bottom of the ocean, yes, but it was saved for a purpose. God wanted me to use it for his glory, even if it was just to have this little talk with you today. A side note uh, is that all my years of diving, I've never seen another weight belt lying on the bottom of the ocean, um, let alone 15 kilometers out at sea in some random spot off of South African coast. That is a miracle story in itself. Uh, I've always looked, wondering, surely there must be an abundance of weight belts at the bottom of the ocean, but there isn't. Another story for you. Hopefully I'll be right telling this one. Nearly two years ago, I decided for the seemingly 300th, 400th, 500th time to lose some weight and get fit. This included getting up early to go for early morning jogs. One morning whilst jogging early into this new regime, I felt a little bit uncomfortable a little bit of chest pain. Long story short, I went to the hospital and was informed that I was having a heart attack. This was one of the worst moments of my life. Sure, there was some physical discomfort. However, however my, my main distress wasn't the physical discomfort. It was the emotions and the thoughts. I was not thinking about the things I had already done or achieved on earth, but rather things that I had not yet done and was hoping to achieve. I wanted to see my children get married, tick for one of them recently. Um, The thought of not being there to, to walk my daughter down the aisle, overwhelming. I wanted to see my grandchildren one day, the, the, The thought of my wife being a widow in her late, sorry, late 40s, no, 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 uh, early 30s, sorry. Um, The thought of my wife being a widow in her early 30s um, was unbearable. (laughs) I, 
I was devastated to think that my time could be up. And it was a reality right in front of me. I knew that I had not yet accomplished that for which I was born. The physical discomfort, yes, not pleasant. The emotional discomfort, discomfort way, way more. I literally watched the doctors save my life on TV. It wasn't a soap opera. <laughs> they inserted a stent through my wrist uh, into my heart. I witnessed the process of this needle thing. Sorry, my medical expertise. Oh, not that great. I watched as they inserted this needle into my wrist and I watched as it tracked in, up into my struggling heart. I watched the dye, they put a special dye inside you and I could see that on the TV. I watched as the dye was trying to make its way through blocked arteries. I watched as the stent was carefully and skillfully placed and then inflated inside my heart. I watched as the doctor showed me how blood restoration had now been restored in that artery which had been blocked. Um, I was overwhelmingly appreciative for being saved by the doctors that day, quite literally. However, my appreciation didn't relate to the physical pain relief at the time. Yes, that was a bit more pleasant, but rather related to the enormous amount of hope that had been restored in me for a positive future. Suddenly, in just moments, there was a brand new hope. I was being told that I could expect to possibly live a long and healthy life, subject to some lifestyle changes, of course, which now includes plenty of running. A little bit nerve-wracking when you go for that first run again after a heart attack, but um, all good. I, consider my, I considered and still do consider all the money spent on saving my life the thousands of dollars it costs for the medical staff, the medical facilities, the aftercare, all that money was not spent by all of us, our government, Medicare system, just to relieve me of some physical pain that day. Rather, it was spent to give me a future. I was saved that day to give me a future on this earth. I'm regularly amazed at the extraordinary lengths that we as human beings go to to save one another in, during these times of devastating situations. Romans 6.4. Let's bring it back to our other story. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. So remember, we're looking at we're saved from and for something, and this leads us really on to what are we saved for? The portion, what's the saved for portion of our salvation? Well, here we go. We're saved for a new life and calling. Jesus saved me today from his power of sin, the slavery that, to which I'm bound by his spirit, my sanctification, and he will save me from the presence of my sin, my glorification. When we receive new bodies, salvation is both body and soul, and not just my conversion, but also my everyday life. Romans 8, 12 to 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we're not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children and if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. 
If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Paul did not view salvation as uh, just an end to itself, but rather as a beginning. We see the language of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. He talks about redemption for the purpose of action, specifically carrying out a holy calling. 2 Timothy 1.9 He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Paul reminded Timothy in these books that he, in, that he uh, was saved by God's grace for God's purposes. Saying that believers are graciously gifted life and immortality. In um, 2 Timothy 1.10, it, it reads as, This has now been made evident through the appearing of our Saviour Christ Jesus, who has abolished death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Paul continues to say that uh, believers are expected to now live up to the standards of this new commonwealth, our new country that we now live in, the new kingdom. The calling of any good citizen is to contribute to the overall welfare of that community, living in a meaningful relationship of giving and receiving, both spiritually and physically. Uh, Philippians 4, 15, 19 reads as follows. And you, Philippians, know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except for you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my need several times. Note that I seek... Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. Another interesting talk about that. But I received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Ephroditus. I'm not sure how you say that name. Um, we'll go with Ephroditus, shall we? What's what you've provided? A fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. A number of years ago then, obviously, I moved from South Africa to Australia. This was in 1991, late 91, to a new hope in Australia, full of, to, to a new life full of hope in Australia. In this process of moving to this country, I needed to let go of some of my past and to embrace the new of this country. Sure, my past was part of my identity, but I was very keen to embrace a new identity in this new country which had welcomed me in. Had I not let go of some of the past, I wouldn't have made room for some of the future. And it's important for my old identity to not rule my new identity as an Australian. In the same way, we now live in a new kingdom as God's kids. The kingdom of God, in this new kingdom in which we now live, Jesus is our ruler. Peter and the apostles, uh, well, this is Acts 5, 29-32. Peter, Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than people. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom he had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and saviour to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. As God's creation, we rejected him. God, in his amazing love for us, has made a way for us to be saved in order to get us back onto the path that he originally planned for the human race. Imagine a, a timeline for the human race 
We deviated from that timeline. We deviated from the original intent, intended path that God had for all of us. But God in his love has provided the opportunity to set us back onto the original trajectory. This was a trajectory whereby we live right with God. A life full of everyday purpose, meaning, love, hope, and support, and a destiny for all, not only in this life, but eternity. Where are you on the spiritual journey of being rescued? Are you experiencing a minor, a minor spiritual heart attack? Or perhaps your heart has um, never been connected to God yet. That can change today. And please speak to one of us. Invite God in. Talk to one of us. We can help you with that process. God wants to have you connected. The pain, the discomfort. Yes, God would like to change the past, but would love to give you a future. One that is full of hope and joy. That can change today. Have you realized that you haven't yet accomplished that for which you were created in God? That your purpose and relationship with God has not yet perhaps been established? Have you already begun, entered in, or still on the way toward God? You may have entered in, but each day God is at work in you and has continued to work, out, work in you as he works out his salvation in, in each of us, Philippians 2, 12, 13, and we have a living hope for the future, the completion, fulfillment of his rescue, the salvation of our dying bodies. A reminder of the text that we read earlier from Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that Christ, just, sorry, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. God wants us to be saved into a new and wonderful life, both physically and spiritually. His plan is for us here on earth is, is for here, his plan is for us to live this life here on earth and eternity. Whilst here on earth, he wants us to live a full life where we can flourish. Living the life that he created us to live. We're going to do a communion shortly following this. Um, as we do that, how does, how does salvation come about? It came about because Jesus went to the cross for us. At the Passover in Egypt, animal blood was dabbed on the door frames, um, and this was to, to provide the opportunity for firstborn children to be saved. For you and me, Jesus came with his own blood. His blood can save us and does save us if it hasn't already. Let's remember Jesus today as we do communion. Can we do communion if possible? Um, folks, as you come forward for communion, remember that which God has done. Remember that which Jesus has done for us. Remember the blood that he spilled for us. Not that he just wants to relieve us of some physical discomfort, but he wants to actually give us this hope. He wants to give us this life on earth. He wants to give us not just uh, uh, our souls being redeemed so we can avoid hell one day, but actually has a plan for each of us here on earth, one where we flourish. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have saved us. We thank you that you are in the process of working out that salvation in each and every one of us. We thank you that you give us joy. You give us amazing inspiration every day. 
We thank you that we can walk and talk with you. We thank you that you are part of our lives. We thank you that you inspire us to do better and, and awesome things. We thank you that you provide for us. We thank you that you look after us. And we thank you that we will spend all eternity with you as well. As we have communion, we, we just remember you this morning and the works that you did, not in sadness, but in joy that you did this for the joy set before you. You enjoyed that, you endured that cross for the joy set before you. You knew that that joy was us coming into your kingdom and knowing and being in relationship with you. Thank you, Father.